So, all right, lab 44, specialized cells. The first kind of specialized cell that we're going to look at develops into these meristematic tissues, will develop into a flower. I'm gonna go through a bunch of flower parts and their names. Every part of the flower, every piece of this helps for fertilization. To get the egg inside of here fertilized or to provide the sperm to other organisms or to the wind or water to help get that sperm to another flower. So we'll start at the bottom. This is the receptacle or the base. It isn't labeled on your illustration here on the next page. The receptacle is like the bottom, or the, I should say the top of the stem, not the bottom of the stem. The bottom of the flower, top of the stem. It supports the growth of the flower on top. <clears throat> These little green petals in which the flower is enclosed until it blooms, these are called the sepals. So they just protect all of the flower parts until the flower is ready to bloom. The petals. The petals are a very important part of helping with fertilization. And plants we call, when well, we're talking about plants, we're talking about fertilization. We're referring to this as pollination. There's a process that attracts pollinators. The different colors, shapes, smells of petals will attract a pollinator. We'll get to the pollinators in just a second. The male portion of the flower, it's called the stamen or the androceum. We've got these two names to know. We're looking at these things right here. So there's two parts to the stamen or androceum. There's the anther. And the filament. The anther has pollen on it. The pollen, each of those teeny, if you remember in lab, they look like almost like dust in the container. Each one of those pieces of dust contains sperm for fertilization. So if you have a pollen allergy, you're allergic to plant sperm. The female portion in the middle here, so it includes all of this here, is called the carpal or the, did I, is that an N? It's a, it is an N, that's not gin, it's gin? Yeah. Okay, that's a, <laughs> I'm gonna ask my plant, my plant person here, Alexa. Ginoseum is, the carpal. The carpal has three parts to it. So we've got these three parts that compose, compose that. The ovule or the ovary is in here at the bottom. What do ovaries have in them? <clears throat> what are you? The egg. The egg, yeah, great. So they have eggs inside of there. You've got the style, which is this long portion. And then here at the tip, you have the stigma. The stigma is the pollen landing pad. If you've ever looked closely at a plant, often the stigma will be sticky. It will release sugars or sap 
to attract pollinators to have a little treat. Hey, come here and eat this candy, sugar, right here. The other thing about that being kind of sticky is that then pollen will stick to it. Pollinators, like bees, for example, they have a lot of hair on them. And the co-evolution between the bee or other, you know, like birds or other insects, um, could even be a mammal with hair. All of those things, when they come here to get a nice treat, all of these that have pollen on them, the stamens that have pollen on them, they're going to like get it all over their hair and their fur. If you've ever seen like a video of uh, a bee and it's just got like yellow all over it because it's got the pollen covering it. What happens then is that the bee will come and it'll lick the nectar here. If it has pollen on it, likely pollen's gonna fall and stick to here. And then it's like, let me go get another tree and another flower. And so now the pollen of this flower, they bring over to the next flower and the next flower. So we have other organisms and or wind, rain, um, water, like flowing water that can bring, that needs to bring the pollen over to other flowers. Okay. So just again, kind of in comparison, the pollen grains might be different colors, like the one you saw in lab was more brownish. If you take a look at this lily, and lilies have a lot of different colors, like this one, for example, it's really yellow. You can see, like if you've ever had lilies, or like lilies have a lot of pollen on them, and it, it like, did you ever see somebody like smell a lily and then they have that like colored stuff all over their face? They got plant sperm all over their face. Yeah, and then you can see the stigma here one of the things to remember that when we're looking at something like this, a lily, we can tell whether it's a monocot or a dicot based on all of the different flower structures. We can count one, two, three, four, five, six petals. That's a multiple of three. Let's count the stamens. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's a multiple of three. And then the stigma has one, two, three parts to the landing pad, the pollen landing pad. So we have something here that we can tell it's a monocot because all of the different flower parts are in multiples. So the American holly tree requires a male tree and a female tree for the production of red berries in the winter. This indicates that the male lacks which parts and the female lack, flower lacks which parts. Which one would it be? Which one are they lacking? C. You said C? Yeah? One? Is that what you're saying? C? Okay. Sorry, I couldn't tell. Like B, B, C, D, E. Okay, so we have to think kind of backwards. Like males do not have carpels, females do not have stamens. A little bit about the relationship between flowers, fruits, and seeds. The flowers we just talked about, it's a reproductive part. The fruit, the fruit is a ripened ovary. We learned this in lab last week. So if you, let's say, you know, this time of year, you're having a nice honey crisp apple, you're eating the apple tree's ovary, and then inside you have the seeds. And what do you do with the, the apple core with the seeds in it? You throw it out, right? So you've just eaten an ovary and you've thrown away a bunch of babies. You have a bunch of sickos. So seeds can come in a variety of different kinds. Like I just mentioned, apples have tiny little black seeds. You are gonna have a peach pit. So this is the ovary. And then inside there's the embryo 
of the plant. And you also have like, this is called endosperm. It's like a secondary kind of um, thing that happens in reproduction. So it gives the embryo some food until it can germinate or break from the seed. So back to pollination. Pollination is important in the process of fertilization. It's another, you know, I always say plants are super weird. Just imagine if you, and you're a person who is wanting to have a child, and some other species has to bring the sperm to the egg in your process. That's what happens with flowers. That'd be weird. Pollination refers to pollen landing on the stigma that has that sticky, gooey nectar on it. And landing can be via wind, or if it's more of an aquatic flower, water. But a lot of times the pollen, like I said before, like a bee will go from flower to flower to flower, and it will bring the pollen to the flower. So there's a lot of different ways pollination can occur. I've mentioned them. Wind, water, insects, even bats, birds. Think about all the coatings or coverings on different kinds of animals, whether we're talking about feathers or fur, uh, little tiny hairs on insects, they all can have pollen stuck to them. So there's a little bit of that like co-evolution again in there that while those structures might help keep us warm or might help us to feel, they also can assist with pollination. evolutionary significance of a flower with a larger brightly colored with larger brightly colored petals okay so now be careful with this because like for example the wind is a significant significant factor in pollination especially because of the larger petals so this is about the wind right does that have anything to do with necessarily the color of the petals no that's about the wind so while that might be a true statement, and here's the thing that sometimes you have to remember that when you're reading test answers, you might run into true statements, but that doesn't mean they answer what your question is asking, so be careful with that. Such plants are usually self-pollinators and do not rely on the external factors for pollination. That sounds like, I'm not sure that that really has anything to do with the bright, with color, bright colors. In general, these are aquatic plants. Water aids in pollination, irrespective of color and odor. That sounds interesting, but I don't know. I'm not feeling good about that one. These flowers are more attracted to animals that act as pollinators. Yeah. That sounds kind of good, right? Such flowers produce only microspores or megaspores, not both. Okay, so we kind of narrowed down to, we said maybe like these three, Sound kind of good. Which one sounds the best? D. Yeah, good. So D sounds the best. So just this is a good example of like you can read stuff and be like, that's true, but doesn't answer the question. All right, last bit, effects of hormones. This will be reflective into what you are going to do to write up lab 24. I think it's interesting the evolutionary relationship between organisms having just basic kinds of things like we have hormones that help to send messages and control a lot of our metabolic functions in our body so do plants so one for example is auxins auxins influence a whole bunch of things so one is phototropism there's like photo in there what that means is that if you set a plant in the window where does it eventually lean toward the sun toward the sun right so your plants go like this so at home, you should every so often like turn your plants. Also gives the backside of the plant a little more access to sun. 
apical dominance. Remember, apical means the roots and the shoots, the tops and the bottoms. So it's going to help the top grow, helps buds that are up top start to grow, and it doesn't help any buds on the stem or in the lateral part of the plant. Helps the root. So there, again, apical dominance would refer to the top and the roots on the bottom, the tips. Also helps with cell elongation, which means that it can help the plant to grow taller and root further. So these are all, these are all connected in terms of growth. Some of the hormones have a little kind of overlap in their control and what they help with in metabolic functions. Like gibberellins and auxins do similar, but some, kind, some, some different things. This is gibberellins or gibberellic acid, what you're working with in lab 24. So one, yeah, yeah. The term germination. So we're talking about gibberellins, and this is one of the things that you are inadvertently going to analyze or study in the lab. As I know right now, you're just measuring, you're measuring the growth, but you are also in your, kind of in the back of your mind, remember that you are also tracking germination because you're noting how many seeds have produced plants, right? Yeah, you're tracking how many in each quadrat that you're doing. So one of the things that gibberellins does, and I want you to kind of like think about this when you're watering your plants today and you're measuring them, is how many seeds germinated or broke from their seed to produce a plant. You're gonna look at the percentages between dwarfs, treated, and your standard plants. So think about that a little bit. So again, germination, remember this. And I'm gonna remind you next week too, germination, specifically means the emergence or breaking from a seed to produce a plant. There's a question in the lab that refers to what percent of the seeds germinated. And a lot of times students will say, well, these ones grew the longest. I'm like, that's not germination. So again, get that in your, get that in your head. Germination means sprouting from the seed. We won't get this far in our experiment, but eventually what would happen is your pea plants would produce fruit or pea pods. So if we were going to maybe do a whole semester study of this and had better planting methods, we could look at how much fruit is developed. And cell division and elongation, which is very similar to what auxins do, right? They make the plants grow taller. So there's an overlap between oxys and gibberellins, which means that when you're taking a look, like if there's a question and it gives you an example of like which of the following hormones would contribute to the growth and height of a plant, you could answer both oxins and gibberellins to that. If it says which one is contributing to germination, fruit development, and growth of height, then that eliminates auxins. If it says which one produces the ability of phototropism and growth, that specifically would refer to auxins and not gibberellins. So you gotta remember these little things. With the gibberellins, what you're looking at for lab is you're looking at the difference between two phenotypes based in genotypes of pea plants. What are the two phenotypes you're studying? Yeah, standard and dwarf. So you have standard, which produce naturally gibberellins. The dwarf plants do not. So let's say that gibberellins Gibberellins 
are going to be the capital G or the dominant allele here and dwarf. We're going to call that little g. That argibarellin, so if this is the allele, we have two different alleles. We've got the dominant allele, production of gibberellins, and the recessive allele, no production of gibberellins. So that our genotypes for those that produce gibberellins could be capital G, capital G, or capital G, little g. And your genotype for dwarf has to be little g, little g. individual who's got one of each kind of gene that because it has the dominant gene or allele it functions the same way as one that is big G big G or homozygous dominant but it carries the dwarf gene it doesn't express it one of the things about dwarfs is that dwarfs they never grow enough they may have maybe, maybe just on their own, they may get some fruit development, but they will probably get very little. Just like the germination, just thinking about your data, not even looking back at it, do you have less dwarfs that germinated than you did standard? Yeah, right? So you should see a lot less dwarfs that you're taking data on than your standard plants. So all of these functions they might be able to do just on their own without having this hormone at much, much smaller incremental rates of that. So they, if they don't produce much fruit, how do they stay in the population? So if they don't produce offspring, how do we keep having dwarfs in our population? Yeah, well, heterozygous. Like, yeah, so good. So, if you have two heterozygous individuals mate, that when two heterozygous mate, there is a 25% chance that they will have a dwarf. And that's how the dwarfs stay in the population. Might be something you want to write down. Take a picture of whatever you need to do. Last hormone I want to talk about is ethylene. Ethylene is very, very practical to understand what ethylene does, for the own sake of your fruit, all the fruit and you know a lot of vegetables we learned, or some of you realized last week that a lot of vegetables are actually fruit because a fruit has seeds. So a lot of what we call a vegetable is actually a fruit. If you don't want, what do we typically do? We have drawers, right, in our refrigerators and we put all of our fruit and vegetables together in there. One of the things that, um, or on the counter, you have like put your whole basket of bananas and oranges and apples out on the counter. Ethylene, what it does is it, as a fruit ripens, it starts to release more and more and more of ethylene gas. So that with ethylene, if you have, especially like bananas, like uh, you have one banana that's getting brown and let's say you have oranges and apples on the counter, that banana is giving off the ethylene and it's going to make all of your other fruit ripen faster. This is just like why bananas, like if one goes, uh, starts to ripen faster, they're connected by the stem 
and it'll send the ethylene through the stem, and then they all go bad at the same time. So a couple practical things is if you have bananas, take them all apart. I know like probably six months ago, eight months ago, people were talking about these little banana hats that you put it on the stem. I saw it everywhere, and I thought it was so, I'm like, ah. It's keeping the ethylene from escaping into the rest of your environment so that it doesn't let the ethylene get to your other fruits and vegetables. So you can get a little hat for your banana stems or you could just like separate them. And especially if you have fruit that like starts to go, that starts to ripen, you can put it in another room or at least across the room. Sometimes in my house you find apples in the living room and my family's like, oh gosh, her and her craziness. All right, so appropriate for this time of year, a lot of people do apple picking. We see definitely a lot more apples in the grocery stores. One rotten apple spoils the whole barrel because the rotting apple produces what? Apple Good. Yeah, so practical application. One of the possible consequences for a plant with a defective gene for the production of gibberellins or gibberellic acid would be think about what we just talked about. So is it rapid rotting the fruit? No. no. An increased rate of lateral root development? Mm -hmm. The development of fruit without fertilization? We have to talk about that. A longer dormancy period for the plant seeds? Yes. Okay. An increased rate, increased rate of stem elongation? No, right? So this would be true if it had gibberellin. So like if you get to these two, you gotta remember, what is the question asking? There you go. And if you grow coleus, which are these kinds of plants, a lot of people have them in their house and outside. If you grow coleus plants, you will need to cut or pinch off the top bud frequently to keep the plant from becoming really tall and spindly. Pinching off this bud will slow the production of what by the apical bud and allow the plant to become bushy? Oxen, cytokinin, gibberellin. This is an ethylene. Which one sounds the best? Which one had the body? Oxen. Yeah, oxen. It's good. So, in any of your, if you're somebody who's like into plants, like for example, you could like see here or here, the apical bud or the very top bud. One of the things you can do with your house plants or even like tomato plants, really good to do if your tomato plant starts to go really tall and skinny and then it can't support the weight of the fruit or the tomatoes, is you go and keep pinching off or you know get like little scissors and these little top, the little top buds. And then what that does is it doesn't allow auxins to keep it growing up. It starts to spread out and it becomes bushier rather than taller. Another practical thing. All right, any questions about plants? We'll come back and do a little review in a bit. Let's, um, what do you have next in your notes? Do you have fungi? Yeah, oh, fungi. I used to have them out of order, and now I think I put them in order, and I don't remember what I do all the time. Okay, so fungi. Uh, could be like typical looking mushrooms. Remember the gills? You looked at under the microscope. Some mushrooms are real weird looking. Look at this one. It's super cool. Fungi. Fungi are so, so, so important as a, there's two major groups that are the decomposers, fungus and bacteria. And so this time of year, when the leaves start falling, little tiny fungi all around in the ground and ones that are microscopic even, they eat up all this plant matter and they help to also put some into the ground so that all of these leaves, the nutrients inside of them, they get the energy, they get rid of the nutrients into the ground. All of the leaves that have fallen have now left behind via the fungus and the bacteria, really good nutrients for when conditions become optimal in the spring and the plants can grow again. It also is kind of nice because these dead things or the waste of dead things, they're just not piling up everywhere. 
So key features, we looked at a bit of this the other day. Fungus are mostly multicellular. There are some that are microscopic. Or the spores, that portion of the fungi are microscopic. They're floating in the air. Some of the things that just randomly make you sneeze. The entire body of the fungus is called mycelium. We say it's a filamentous body because the mycelium are made up these thread like structures called hyphae. You could say hyphae, hyphae. So that if I'm looking at like my shirt here, my shirt, the entire shirt is the mycelium and then uh, each individual thread like I can kind of see if I stretch it, I can see some threads, those would be the hyphae. Here you also have some fruiting bodies. You looked at under the microscope the other day too. And you can see all these little tiny dots on there, those are spores. And these spores could grow that fungus. They float in the air somewhere else. If we look at fungus under the microscope even further, so we take a look at the hyphae, so we could see the strands, and we could go further and see individual strands. And if we go further, and we had a really, really strong microscope, what we would see is that the fungus, they have cell walls. So here's an interesting thing, if you didn't realize that, you know, not only plants have cell walls, but fungus, some protists have cell walls, and um, some bacteria have cell walls. So, in the cell walls, you have these little tiny pores. And from those pores, so fungus do a different kind of digestion than we do. We are heterotrophs, we do an internal digestion. They do their digestion, even though they're heterotrophs, outside of their body. So they release enzymes and acids outside of their body through the pores. So whatever they're sitting on, they release it onto there enzymes and the chemicals do their magic. <laughs> Speaking of. Um, and then they suck in the digestive material, the broken down chemicals, the broken down enzymes all together. Thank goodness. So again, they, it's like they secrete the enzymes outside of their body. It's kind of like they're puking on whatever they're eating. So imagine if you're like, ooh, I got this great piece of pizza, and you threw up your enzymes and the hydrochloric acid and all the other good stuff in your stomach, and you just let it like, and then you ate it. That's like what, I'm, what fungus do. It's also specifically dead things or waste. All right, so now think about it. You got a big pile of poop that you picked up, you puke on it, and then you eat it. Or a dead bird. There's a lot of other functions that fungus do to get energy and nutrients, um, is that they might feed on living things and cause disease, which we'll get to some of those. They're in the parasite category. Or like, like lichen, they're symbiotic. So all of these little mushrooms are just puking on this wood. And you can also see some nice moths there, right? The bryophyta, plantae bryophyta, and the fungi. They can produce both asexually and sexually. They use spores. The spores are gonna carry, it's like a little reproductive package that can go elsewhere. So like black bread mold, for example, they do this shooting of their spores out into the air, but these fruiting bodies, the mycelium of the black bread mold, are usually microscopic. In groups, you start to actually see that black on your bread, or it could be like white black bread mold, that's the white kind, but these spores are finer, way finer, than even when you were looking at the, um, the plant, the, the, the 
once the plant they need is from the male. The what? The pollen. Yeah, pollen. Thank you. So pollen. This is like way finer than pollen. Way, way, way. So right now there's some floating in the air. We don't even. We can't even see it. That's how fine it is. Fruity bodies can be very different. Again, here's a couple other different kinds. These are morels. This time of year, you can make a lot of money hunting these in the forests. So we just go, a uh, bunch of us in the biology department, we have a conference. We go to Star Rock. One time I got up early and I was going for a hike by myself. And then there was like three men coming this way behind me and three this way. I was on like the trail. And I was like, oh, they're gonna, they're gonna murder me. <laughs> and they were just in a line, and they were, and then I was like, when I realized they weren't gonna murder me, I was like, what are you guys doing? And they were like, we're hunting for morels. If a really strong fungicide is released and eliminates all the fungi in an ecosystem, which of the following is likely to happen? Would that improve the growth of plant species? Would it be the faster breakdown of leaf litter? It's gonna slow it down, right? An accumulation of dead and discarded plants and animal tissues? Yes. That's, I think that sounds kind of good. Is it gonna help soil fertility? No, definitely not. Is it gonna increase the rate of photosynthesis? What is it gonna do? So fungicide, meaning we, like, we're gonna get rid of all of the fungi the result of that is, you know, we're, we have only bacteria then as decomposers, so we're going to get an accumulation of all this stuff, and that's going to be a gross world. So let's take a look at a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and in either a photosynthetic algae or bacteria. You looked at this under the microscope. Lichen, the CH is a K sound, lichen, not lichen, lichen. This looks a little different than what you saw under the microscope in lab because this is not stained. So here you're seeing the true colors. That here we can see the mycelium of the fungus that's clear. You don't really see, it's not, it's not strong enough to see the hyphae. And then you have the symbiotic photosynthetic algae or bacteria here. So this would be an awesome relationship to have because if you were that photosynthetic algae or bacteria, you'd get a house inside of the fungus. It's gonna protect you. It could rain and you're like, ah, oh, the fungus is getting wet and I'm dry inside here. It's like our houses. And the algae or the bacteria through photosynthesis provide food in the form of sugars and other metabolic results of photosynthesis, like fats and proteins and complex carbohydrates. And this would be so awesome if you could get 90% of your energy needs from something that just lives inside of you and all you gotta do is get a little sunlight, get a little water, breathe, all that stuff. Just easy peasy. Um, this is a fun, I mean, this is a lichen that I found on a rock. I get real excited about stuff. In my family, I'm like, look at this, this is so cool, it's a lichen. And they go, moving on. Mycorrhiza, Mike or I, za. Mike, Mike or I, za. Mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza is another symbiotic relationship between fungus and the roots of plants. So the fungus get to live inside the roots of the plants this time. We typically find these in plants who have very dry, you'll find a lot more in plants that have dry sandy soil, but most plants have mycorrhiza and have this relationship. So here, what the fungus does is the fungus is like, I'm gonna absorb a lot of water, tons and tons of water. It's gonna help the roots. It also does what the roots do. It's gonna like add more 
water and minerals, nutrients from the soil. And it gives them over, it shares. It takes what it needs and it gives some over to the roots. And the roots, right, they're storage spaces of photosynthesis that happens, remember photosynthesis happens up here at the leaves. And then sugars come down and other metabolic chemicals of photosynthesis. And then anything that's left over is stored in the roots. So the roots can give some of that to the fungus as well. What is the tube that transports sugar down the roots of the plants? Which one is it? I heard it. Yeah, good. Flow on. Remember the pH is an F sound, flow on. The sugars flow down. What does this do? What does xylem do? Yeah, good. Water goes up. Flowing sugars go down. Um, can you go back to the slide? I'm sorry, go oh, back to the slide? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. sure. Thank you. Penicillium. What do you notice about the word? Penicillin. Penicillin's in there. Yeah. So penicillium is a mold that produced the first antibiotic. <clears throat> Penicillium is a genus name. That's why it's italics, and that's why the P is capitalized. Penicillium is the mold. Penicillin is the antibiotic. So this is not, the species is not penicillin. The species is penicillium that produces penicillin. So this is kind of cool that the way it was discovered was totally by accident that um, a scientist named Fleming, he was growing bacteria on a plate and he noticed that he had this like mold growing and that mold was penicillium and around that penicillium, no bacteria were growing. And so this like fungus got onto his bacterial plate and he was like, but this thing, whatever this thing is, it's killing. The bacteria so it must have some antibacterial mechanism to it and that's how penicillin was discovered totally by accident and just good critical thinking of looking and going something's going on here penicillin can be produced well i'm going to say penicillium can produce a product like this on oranges you ever get an orange and you open up the bag and you're like just like Puff comes out because you got one in there that's like moldy. That's penicillium. It's growing on there. Blue cheeses, if you like blue cheeses, it's penicillium, which gives it that taste. Um, if you're sick and you're like, oh, I'm sick, I'm going to just eat this moldy orange to treat my sickness, penicillium, the product of it, has to be processed in a lab to be the penicillin that you need. I mean, certainly if we have like you know, the zombie apocalypse, this might be an option to help us, but it gets processed somewhere else. If you get rid of that orange, usually, and what I would do is, like, what, I, well, what I do, is if I have an orange in a bag and this is in there, I wash them all really good. I use a little bit of like soap, a little tiny bit, and I wash them really well, because those spores are tiny and can be stuck in those little like crevices of the oranges, but you just give them a wash and they should be free of the penicillium. Yeast, you also looked at this under the microscope last week. Produce yummy things like bread and also beer and wine through a process called fermentation. So what we're gonna do today, what, right away when I get in the lab, I'm going to take some uh, spoonful of yeast, a couple spoonsful of sugar, some warm water, and I'm going to cover it with saran wrap in the container. And then we're going to let them, the yeast, eat the sugars. And once they run out of sugars, they're going to start to undergo anaerobic respiration. Or what? I shouldn't say that. Once they, they'll eat the sugar and then the oxygen that's in the top, once they use the oxygen up, 
then they're going to start going into anaerobic respiration. So lack of oxygen, lack of sugar. They go into anaerobic respiration, um, and they start to produce carbon dioxide. So the container should start to like produce gas. The way that yeast reproduce, oh, and then in like, let's say that we let that sit for a couple days, we could drink that water off the top and it would be alcohol. The way that yeast reproduce is through budding. You saw that under the microscope, that this is a yeast, and they start to produce a genetically identical copy of themselves. It's an asexual form of reproduction. They make their buds. This kind of reproduction only works in things that are aquatic because you don't have gravity when you're in water. Imagine you, if you're sitting here and a little head starts popping out, and all day your bud is coming out and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm carrying my backpack, I gotta carry my bud around, right? Eventually, if you're like, half your bud is grown, that's heavy. That's half your weight. That doesn't work with gravity, so we haven't evolved the ability to do this, but this favors, this form of reproduction budding favors organisms that live in water. So some of them do that. This is called palabolus. It's a cat-throwing fungus. They look like these clear fungi. It looks like they have little hats on their heads, right? Little cats. The spores accumulate in their caps. You can see all this water on here. They absorb a lot of water from below them. And eventually what happens is they, like a balloon, it gets so much pressure inside that it goes bigger, bigger, and then pop. And the place that they put the pressure is in the caps so that they keep adding more water and spores up here until it pops. And that's the throwing of their spores. They sometimes call it puffing because they just like, and then a puff of spores and water comes out. If you ever see these, you could, uh, they're real tiny. They're like, what is If you ever saw like uh, a log in the wood, if you look closely, you might find these. And you, if you just like gently blow on them, they might start to puff. Okay, so part of their life cycle is that they need their spores to get into the digestive system of another animal, like a deer or an elk those kind of foresty type mammals. Can you imagine if you could, the only way you can complete your life cycle is to be pooped out by something else, to get eaten and pooped out. It's kind of gross. So they've got to get into that digestive tract. When organisms have to do this, like some of the plants who have thicker coatings around their seeds, like a, um, like apple seeds or peaches, for example, like with the pits, plums, they need to get eaten and digested by something else because it has to break down the chemicals and the enzymes have to start to break down that outer hard seed coating. And so that if they don't get digested, it's much less likely that the embryo can break or germinate from the seed. And so this is kind of like a similar thing is that those spores, they need that outer casing to go through the digestive tract for the outer casing to weaken. And so they can finish off their next generation or they can add to the next generation. So as I mentioned, the pressure can build up. These are like millimeters, teeny, teeny, teeny to maybe a couple centimeters, maybe a couple centimeters. So they're tiny organisms who can puff 3.5 millimeters or 12 feet. So about, probably about from here to the door, something like this big. And that's how hard or high the water pressure gets in their caps. That's pretty impressive. All right, so. 
what happens is these, they're going to puff. They have phototropism. So a lot of times we just think like plants have phototropism, but look at, aren't they leaning in the same direction? They're leaning, they actually have an affinity toward leaning to the sun. And this will make sense because how do they, I mean, if you were an elk, you might not be like, hmm, fungus. But if you're an elk, you might go, ooh, grass. I like to eat grass. Grass is kind of sweet and it tastes good and I like to eat in the sun. So what they do is they put their heads toward the sun and they puff and the, the evolutionary mechanism is that if you lean toward the sun, you're probably gonna hit something like grass that the elks will eat. And then over there, your little spores get eaten by the elks and they eat it and then they poop it out somewhere else. And then from the poop, these come out again and they lean toward the sun and they get to the grass and then we have this cycle that keeps happening. So pretty, you know, for something, it's always amazing that you have organisms that don't have a nervous system, but stuff like this happens. That's pretty complex behavior for something very simple. So that's one of the amazing things about life is that when we say like, oh, humans, we're the highest evolved. And I don't know, this is pretty like, they've been around for a long time. Bacteria, archaea, have been around for a long time. Like who's smarter genetically? Simple often is like much better. So the only thing I don't like about this is it should be, its head should be cranked in that direction. Some fungus can be parasites. Here's the bad news. Um, so cordyceps, The Last of Us, pretty cool. I read, I read a, a book that, this was like way before that, and, um, that was probably like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that it was about these cordyceps that, you know, passed around through humans. Um, insects are the biggest animal group in the rainforest and the way that their populations are controlled is by fungus, fungal spores that get into them and eat them from the inside out. It keeps their populations in check. Uh, we'll get to that in a little more detail here. Okay, so one kind of parasitic fungus that are arthrobotters, arthrobotters. Arthrobotters produce these little rings or traps, they try and trap nematodes. Uh, nematodes themselves are parasites, so don't feel so bad for the nematodes. Another way for one parasite to control another parasite's population numbers. But it's pretty cool that you can see their hyphae, they have some hyphae that are just like more stringy and some hyphae that form into these attached traps or circles hanging off the stringy hyphae. Oh, so the nematode, These are round worms. They're also parasites. But I always think it's cool. Like, look at all these little traps that are set. Even until it's just swimming around and when the nematode swims through a trap, it responds by puffing up. And when it puffs up, it makes it harder, makes less surface area for the nematode to get through. So it like, you can see the difference between these ones that are thinner and these ones that are puffed up. So when they feel there's some kind of evolutionary mechanism that then feels something going, touching it, it becomes trapped. Here's another species of, of um, arthrobotters. So you can see this one is more like circle, connected to circle. Again, they'll puff up when a nematode comes through. Here's another species. All right, here's the other thing that they do. When they get trapped, or when arthrobotters even feel movement around them, like some of the hyphae are starting to get touched, they start bing, bing, shooting out spores that have little tiny points on the end. And so it's like little tiny bullets that whatever's in its environment, which often is nematodes, 
is that those little tiny bullets are getting, right? You get shot with a bullet, it goes inside of your body. But that bullet has a spore of this fungus inside. So now that fungus is starting to grow inside of this organism. And like I showed you with the insects, is that they start to like get eaten from the inside out. And here's just another, another species. Which of the following is not a job of a fungus? Are fungi decomposers? Okay, so that's a job of fungus. Are fungus, some of them parasites? Are some of them predators? What's the, the definition of predation is the act of killing and eating another organism. Have we seen predators? Yeah, those are the robbers for sure, right? Are they producers? Are the fungus themselves producers? Even in lichen, they have a symbiotic relationship with a producer, but they themselves are not. So they're not a producer. Are they pathogens? Are they disease causing? Yeah, so remember, when you have something like a lichen, it doesn't mean that the fungus is the producer. It means it's in a relationship with a producer, which is different. All right, these are called chytrids. The CH is a K sound, chytrids. If you ever study amphibians, you'll learn about chytrids because they are hugely destroying populations of amphibians around the world. We haven't gotten to amphibians yet, but amphibians are semi-aquatic. They have to stay tied to water their whole life. For example, tadpoles, which are the beginning stages of a, an amphibian, they're in water. They live in water. So they have to lay their squishy eggs in water to keep the eggs moist, and then the eggs undergo a metamorphosis from a fish-like creature, a tadpole, to eventually getting arms and legs and a tail and better lungs. So. The amphibians are closely tied to water. Kittreds are in water. Kittreds have been around for a really long time. They're often decomposers, but they can also be pathogens or um, parasites. So these die-offs, so if you hear about these die-offs, mass die-offs of frogs around the world, this is what they're tied to. Ergots. This is something that will infect or be a parasite to rye and other bread type plants. We also see it in um, corn, a lot of crops. So ergots are kind of interesting in that um, if you ate an ergot, it's got two things that it can do to you. One, it can make you super high, but then it can kill you at the same time. So I guess you die like, uh, so some people seek out and eat these, but you gotta make sure you have the right quantity because if you just go beyond that point, you will die. They can cause convulsions, hallucination, gangrene. You can lose like a foot. A lot of um, cattle who eat grasses that have ergots in them, they just stop producing milk or produce very low quantities of milk. This is how LSD is made, is from ergots. So it gets processed in a lab to become LSD. 